Good evening everyone, uh, I'm Mohamed Nabil and today I want to talk about how far is too far, pushing the limits of science and technology. So, first of all, um, I want to just tell you a little something that happened to me a few weeks ago. So a couple of weeks ago, I had to give a TED audition and during that TED audition, I decided that I wanted to speak about, simply put, science, just science. So, that's obviously a very large topic, okay? So, and that requires stacks of drafts, hours of research, and long hours of pondering pages, pages and pages of just deep thought processing, analyzing, and all that. So naturally, I put it off until the last night. Then, well, long story short, I made it, but barely, and I told myself, never again, never again would I allow myself to procrastinate in such a manner on something as important as this. And when my teachers came up to me and told me, Nabil, we want you to try again. We're going to have a rehearsal for you, and we're going to let you try again one more time. Just modify your speech, tweak it a bit here, and drop another draft. So I immediately went home, set pen to paper, and wrote nothing for two weeks. So, <laughs> I know, but what happened? Why did I just revert back to that? Why, why was I repeating my mistake? Why did I suddenly go back on procrastinating even though I promised myself I would not do so? Well, why was I, li technically, I'll tell you what I was really doing. I was reverting from order, okay, of writing a simple speech to chaos, of putting it off. After all, that is chaos, and, and in science, we call chaos entropy. But you know what isn't chaotic? Science. Science isn't chaotic at all. See, it's not like we can blame science for all the chaos it's caused in the world. It's not like science actually caused chaos. It's not like science caused any wars, tragedies, or problems. That's us. E equals MC square didn't annihilate two entire cities along with a quarter of a million people. That was us. So, science isn't evil. It's just a tool. It's a tool through which we exert our will on shaping the world around us. But at the same time, it's something that also doesn't possess sentience, doesn't it? What does possess sentience, humans? But then what's artificial that possesses sentience? AI. AI is something that we've been fixated on for the past couple of years now. We are really obsessed with perfecting AI. And you know what basically AI represents to most of us? It's human perfectibility, right? It's getting the job done so well with minimum loss on anything. There's no sacrifices when it comes to AI. But there is one. It's sacrificing human values. It's sacrificing human uh, emotions and feelings. See, when we talk about methods of perfectibility, human perfection, of which many of us think as basically utopia, we think of, well, at least I think of, genetic engineering. I think of en biological enhancements. And Basically, you know what you get when you put all of these together? You get the utopian human. You get the superhuman. And the superhuman exists only in utopia. And now, that kind of makes sense. Because ever since the Stone Age, we've been using science to develop um, tools to help make our lives better so that then our needs are satisfied so that then we reach something called utopia, where there's no conflicts, there's peace, and most of all, we get everything we want without losing on anything we don't want to lose. So how far are we actually willing to push to achieve this? How far are you willing to achieve everything you've ever want, desired? 
and that's where my speech actually comes to a point. I'm going to talk about a specific computer called Multivac. And it's, and it's a computer, not just any computer. It is the supercomputer of supercomputers, and it lives in a book of Isaac Asimov. And Isaac Asimov is called as the father of science fiction. Okay, not just science, any science fiction though. He's the father of mechanical science fiction, analytical science fiction, basically anything to do with something that's not possible now, but it makes sense that it, it can be achieved. It's just that we can't achieve it right now. So let me get back to multivac. Multivac has the calculating power of many hundreds of thousands of billions of machines all in one. Okay, and then taking data, da data, data from um, all the resources around the world. It can calculate pretty much anything. And when I say anything, I mean the future. Science enabled us to create a machine which can in, uh, predict the future. Now here's the tricky part. In the future, we have good things and bad things. Leaving aside the good things, bad things include crimes, terrorist attacks, um, deaths, natural disasters. Natural, dis natural disasters, okay, it's good. We can, if you can find out when they happen, how they happen, we can prevent those. But then what about crimes? What if I said, for example, you at the back, what if I said, that, yes you, what if I said that Multivac just told me right now that tomorrow you are about to steal two candies, two candy bars from the kid next to you? Okay, and this is proven on the data. And you, you, you're not, you're like, okay, what? And then tomorrow it actually happens, even though you never really expected that, oh, I was, I, I'm actually gonna steal these candy bars, okay? So that means you're about to commit a crime, and I know you're about to commit a crime. What's the natural reaction? I stop you. So then is it right that I stop you before you committed the crime? Should I wait for you to commit the crime? What happens if it goes from simply stealing two candy bars to, let's say, revenge on someone who betrayed you, and that revenge comes in the form of stabbing them, shooting them? In other words, murder. Then do I wait for you to at actually attempt to attack him? Is that right? Why don't I just stop you right now? In that case, you haven't done anything wrong, have you? In that case, all you've done is just, you've, been, you've had the high chance of committing something bad, but you haven't done it. I'm arresting you for something you haven't done, but you're likely to. It's very confusing to get our minds around, but that's exactly what science has for us. Let's, let's try something else. Instead of multivac, let's talk about cybernetics. Evil robot monkeys. Let's say that monkeys, which are currently test subjects in many, uh, many labs, as we know, are given mechanical arms, um, mechanical hearts, okay? And obviously, these things have an advantage over our hearts. They're obviously way more efficient, okay? And we put these monkeys back in their cages along with their fellow primates who are not enhanced. Do you know what happens? None of the, this monkey who was cybernetically enhanced is suddenly not a part of his community. He has just been rejected by everyone. He's considered a freak. And he has just been, now he's an outcast. Even though he is by far superior to all of them, he's an outcast. Now, do the same thing to humans, but instead of just doing it voluntarily, let's say we did it to someone who has no limbs. Let's say we did it to someone who has Alzheimer's, and we perform some kind of surgery on them or whatever that produces a visible mark on them that tells that they have been uh, worked upon. And then... In doing so, not only we have we made them better, we've made them superior to us, but would we accept them again? I mean, think about our community already right now. We, we literally cannot help just seeing a room of people and then immediately just suddenly classifying them like that. And along with that, we associate labels, we associate values, and we associate qualities. We, we don't even know anything. We just immediately, based on appearance, I mean, like, I could say black and white, and then immediately you're going to think, okay, white, black, I can immediately assume a lot of values for that. And then you suddenly throw in, okay, 
Now we have normal, you have brain freak, and then you have Mr. Muscle Guy, who has, been, who has not lifted a single weight in his life, but he's as jacked up as you are, and he could probably throw you across the room. But just because he's superior doesn't mean he's any better, is it? Well, is it? So that's something else. We can't decide on that. Let's try something else, though. Let's talk about not just us. Let's talk about a machine that can talk, sorry, a machine that can reveal the past. It's not far-fetched, is it? It's possible. There are, there are trace, everything leaves a trace. Let me put it like that. Everything leaves a trace. When I move my hand like this, I leave air currents, and those can be detected, and someone with proper instruments and readings can tell that I just moved my hand like this. They can calculate everything. So that means I can calculate the past. Yes? Yes, I can calculate the past. Here's the thought. When does the past start? If I have a machine that can find out uh, about the past, immediately reveal anything anywhere in the world that happened in the past, when does the past actually start? Then? Bam, it just happened right now. The, the, that, was, uh, that was past, did you see that? Oh, it happened again, just wait for it. Past. Okay, so one second ago was the past. Meaning, it's also the present, is it not? I could technically go onto my machine and find out exactly what my coworkers are doing one second ago, which equally just also basically is the present. I mean, why get technical? It is the present. Think about the implications. If that machine became a commercial, became available for commercial use, heck, it doesn't even have to be commercial. Give it to the government. Imagine what happens then. They will know everything about you. You will not have any privacy. Even though we'd make amazing, amazing discoveries about the past, we'd learn exactly what happened to uh, dinosaurs. We know, we know everything about our own genome, but we don't know how it came. This machine could solve that. We could find out what our origins are. But at the same time, we could find out what our partner is doing behind their backs. See, we are a society that have sectarian fundamentalist, fundamentalistic beliefs. But we also have nukes. So before I conclude my speech, I want to just talk about one last thing. If we are going to move into the future, we are going to have to evolve. We are going to have to adapt. Who knows? At one point, we'll be traveling out into the stars, and we'll be conquering galaxies. We'll find other life forms, right? What are we going to do when we meet them? Are we just going to stand there and shake their hands and say hi? Why, why would we stop there? What's to say we harvest what they have? What's to say we I mean, come on. Think, let's just. Let's just think about something. Let's, I'm bringing it back to Earth. Let's just bring it back to Earth before we go out there. To fulfill our beliefs, we need resources. So we have the Earth, resources. No one really cares about the Earth right now because we just need those resources for ourselves. As long as our desires are satisfied, we're good. So we harvest resources from the Earth. Imagine our population goes up, more resources. More population, more resources. Now imagine one day there are no more resources but there's a lot of population people. So we look at the sun, and we say, right, let's take over the sun. We'll harvest all the sun's energy. Go on a few million years, you become a stellar civil civilization which has started harvesting multiple suns just to satisfy your own needs. And one day, you find out, when we look back at our past, probably using this machine, we find out that if we had just realized that if we weren't just so selfish, if we had realized that if we had just stuck to the order, if we hadn't gone into entropy and created so much chaos, if we had just realized that we didn't have to strain that entire sun for our own benefit, we would have been much better off helping each other. We would have been much better off if we had just focused on making not just our lives better, but other people's lives better. See. When we say, when I say how far is too far, I mean there is a limit. And then there's a time 
when we have to decide whether we cross that limit or not. Thank you.